consider the sea. It is difficult to imagine how truly vast it is. It is not difficult to imagine the sea as a living thing. It is, in fact, untold billions of living things. Its inorganic substances, water and minerals, are only a part of the whole. Scientists estimate that 80% of all the living things on Earth live within the 330 million cubic miles of our great oceans. The sea must be considered the greatest living natural resource on Earth. Yet even as we conquer the moon, the sea remains virtually unexplored and its tremendous resources barely tapped. The needs of Earth's exploding population are becoming critical. Science and government are beginning to realize that the bounties of the sea must be discovered and put to use wisely and very soon. The coastline of Oregon offers an ideal environment for the study of the sea, a fact which is not being overlooked by the federal government or the people of Oregon. One of the best locations in the entire country for the marine biology research is at the mouth of Coos Bay on the southern Oregon coast. A wide variety of easily accessible aquatic environments make the area ideal for marine study and research. The University of Oregon has established a marine biology institute in the community of Charleston to take advantage of the unique suitability of this area. Situated on 100 acres of university-owned land, the institute lies within the shelter of Charleston Harbor. The Institute is presently housed in a collection of cast-off government buildings. Most of them were originally built to house civilian conservation corpsmen in the 1930s. Others are old Coast Guard buildings added by the University. Wide expanses of mud flats, rich in marine life, are exposed by the outgoing tide. The inlets of Coos Bay offer various examples of ocean bottom, salinity and temperature. Along the coastline outside the harbor are other types of aquatic terrain. A one foot drop in the tide can expose over a mile of rocky ledges, reefs and tide pools teeming with sea animals and plants. of spectacular seascapes. The Arago Lighthouse is perched on a rocky outcropping a short distance from the narrow passage into Coos Bay. At night, it provides one of the few points of reference for ships offshore. There are a few other signs of life along this section of coastline. It remains in a state of extraordinarily natural beauty. Its preservation was assured some years ago by the wise decision of the state of Oregon to make much of the area public parkland. The area is literally a garden of marine organisms. Algae, or seaweed as it is commonly known, has been found in more than 300 varieties. The largest starfish in the world lives in these waters. A small eel-like fish that can breathe out of water was recently discovered under a rock.
because the area is midway between the cold waters of the north and the warm waters of the south, marine life native to both can be studied all within a 20-mile stretch of water. Four miles from the Institute is Cape Arago, to which international attention has been drawn by the unusual research project of Bruce Mate, a graduate student at the university. Bruce has spent many lonely nights on these reefs, watching the sea lions that spend part of every year here. He made himself a suit from a seal skin so he could approach the animals unnoticed. He is now devising a means of embedding tiny radio transmitters beneath the skins of these animals in order to trace their daily and seasonal movements. Long ago, Bruce discovered several elephant seals here, an animal previously unknown to this area. Study at the Marine Biology Institute involves plenty of field work. Still, the Institute itself is where students must spend most of their time. The administration building is one of those recently purchased from the Coast Guard. Thanks to funds provided by the U.S. Public Health Service, it is currently being renovated. The other buildings on the grounds are neither as attractive nor as sound. The cottage for visiting professors and their families is quaint, even cozy in the summertime, but hardly adequate. The Institute's main laboratory and the dining hall are both located inside the same building. It is also a sort of student union. The dining hall has a rustic, camp-like atmosphere. Although it has plenty of seating space, diners have a tendency to gather in the center of the room, especially in the morning hours. The Institute is incredibly high. Maybe it's the good food. Students claim that it is delicious, despite the odors that drift in from the next room. Presently, the labs are not very comfortable places to work. Physical comfort doesn't seem to matter much to most of the students, however. Their major concern is with their experiments. It is the damage that can be done to delicate and expensive equipment by the constant moisture and unstable temperatures that worries people. The need for distilled water is filled, hopefully, by this apparatus. The even more crucial need for constantly circulating seawater is filled by a small and undependable pump a quarter of a mile away.
Despite the handicaps, much precise experimentation and study goes on in the Institute's laboratories. There is another lab for graduate students. Students sometimes find that laundry chores involve as much patience and experimentation as laboratory research. The old Conservation Corps bunkhouses were easily converted into men's and women's dormitories. The men simply moved into one and the women moved into the other. They are exactly alike, thin walls and little space for belongings. The old buildings and appliances have served well, but long years of exposure to the constant moisture has made them weak, and soon they will be useless. These abandoned Coast Guard buildings, recently acquired by the university, are located about a quarter of a mile to the north of the main laboratories. There has been some talk of converting the boathouse into another laboratory, but since there is no money to make the conversion, it will probably remain a boathouse. The rails leading down the ramp are so corroded, however, that it may no longer be suitable for even that. During the winter, the stormy Pacific crashes against the jetty and surges into the mouth of the bay. Charleston Boat Harbor and the Marine Biology Institute are protected by the high headland which forms the southern boundary of the bay entrance. On the quiet waters of the bay, Students like Chuck Holliday go on with the job of tracking down and capturing their specimens. Several projects involving crabs are currently underway at the Institute. The Institute's first full-time director, Dr. Paul Rudy, recently received a grant to study the habits of the Dungeness crab. This project is designed to be of direct benefit to Oregon's multi-million dollar crab fishing industry. These students have come all the way from Dallas, Texas to take advantage of the opportunity offered by the Institute. For one week, they will rise early in the morning and go in search of their own particular sea creatures. They will roam the beaches and the tide pools, and they will spend chilly hours in the classroom and laboratory. They will try to discover how a few of the sea's occupants have adapted themselves in order to survive in their vast and violent world. Somewhere in the secret lives of the organisms they study may lie a lesson of great importance to man. And certainly, the lessons are needed. Colleges and universities in landlocked states are anxious to provide their students with the invaluable field experience they can't get at home. These schools find the Charleston area extremely attractive. The University of Oregon has received a number of inquiries from institutions wishing to send groups of students here to study. Unfortunately, the Institute at Charleston is hardly in a condition to accommodate these requests. That's why these people from Dallas Baptist College have come here in the dead of winter. In the summer, the Institute is occupied completely by the students registered at the University of Oregon. However, many of these students have come from faraway states only for the summer. The University of Oregon would like to be able to keep the Institute going the year round. But until decent housing is available, it is simply out of the question. Still, the Institute is flooded with applications from students who wish to enroll. The spirit of those who are accepted and attend is remarkable. They search for their tiny prey with rapt devotion, and their relationship with their specimens is almost affectionate. The 
kadar bir şey misaflara var. Bir şey 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 var. Bir There's eels that can breathe out of it. It can breathe either in or out of water. And they're ugly. Hmm. They look like... How big are they? Small. They're fish. Look at, that, look at that worm. Those are just like little worms. <gasps> Look at oh the size of those. That one has look at no claws. Hmm. And this one's got all the fish off. Of this one's got claws. Students and researchers at the Oregon Marine Biology Institute are making significant contributions to man's knowledge of life and the sea. A study of the simple brain of a sea slug by physiologist George Dersham may lead to a better understanding of the complicated mechanics of the human brain. Dr. Rudy recently received a grant of $33,000 from the National Science Foundation to continue his research with marine invertebrates. Bruce Mate's research may soon help solve the mystery of the sea lion's migratory patterns. And Jim Buell, a doctoral candidate in biology, has discovered a gas secretion process in fish that had been previously thought not to exist. Although their brains are packed with a phenomenal amount of technical jargon and scientific information, the Institute's people seem to be as normal as anyone else. They are proud of the little cluster of buildings and the work that goes on there. Their world is full of the strange, the beautiful, and the mysterious, and so much to discover and explore.
wooded plateau atop these cliffs is the proposed site for the Institute's new facilities, when and if they are built. The buildings it now occupies will soon reach the point where they are no longer usable. Should the Institute be forced to shut its doors for lack of adequate facilities, students, general citizens, and the business community will have suffered a serious loss. Dr. Ray Hawk, assistant to the president of the University of Oregon and director of university relations, expresses the university's concern for the Institute. I appreciate the opportunity today to talk to the audience about the marine biology station that the university operates at Charleston. We find in the university that we're really reaching the state on many fronts, and this, we think, is one of our most important ones. We now have an astronomy station at Pine Mountain near Bend. We have a Tongue Point Job Corps Center at the old Naval Station at Astoria. But perhaps most important to the university in the way of research would be the biology station now located at Charleston in facilities once occupied by the military services. We feel that this not only provides an excellent research opportunity for our students, but it also is an excellent training facility for many high school biology teachers who come here in the summers taking advantage of an ideal habitat where they can learn while doing and hopefully when they return to the high school classroom, they will be a much better teacher. We also are extremely pleased with what a staff has done in these facilities. The morale of this staff has been excellent. They have worked under conditions where here on campus, I suppose, we would have mass resignations. Our campus never seems to have enough space. We've tried to utilize these excess facilities wherever they have been uh, all over the state of Oregon. And we feel, of course, that the facility there is badly worn out except for the natural habitat that exists and of course I'm now speaking of the sea and the surroundings which make this such a marvelous center. The fact that these staff members have worked and coordinated their efforts to do the job they have is a real testimony to their dedication to provide a meaningful research experience and teaching and learning experience not only to our students but to the high school teachers that I have mentioned. I feel that the university has gone a long ways in developing this site with the limited resources we have, but is nowhere near long enough. Now, we face on our campus the problems of priorities. We are faced with determining how many students we serve, how many buildings can we build, what type of cost per square foot we can put into these buildings, and we now realize that this facility is in danger of extinction unless we are in a position to develop it. We certainly hope that the people of the state of Oregon will get behind this program and help us develop it. Dr. Rudy came to Oregon in March of 1968 from England with experience at the universities of Birmingham and Lancaster. His research in the areas of physiological ecology and marine invertebrates has taken him from the North Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. He realizes, better than most, the tremendous potential of the station at Charleston. The Marine Science Center up at Newport is, uh, uh, takes advantage of oceanography in this broad sense with uh, food technology, fisheries biology, and biology, and chemistry, and physics, all, all participating in a large science center. Uh, Oregon has this. I don't think we should ever try to go this way. What we want is a, is a quality marine biology station here. And uh, this is what it's been in the past, and this is what it will continue to develop, develop towards. So that the, uh, we're complementary to a large marine science center. We would never expect to become an oceanographic institute, as Scripps is, for instance. Well, I think that, uh, uh, that the science, it's, it's pretty well known that the science is going to grow, and now we're expecting to get so much from the sea. Do you think that, that uh, uh, in uh, improving this institute will take up the slack for long? Won't there be a time we'll even need more than that? As far as food goes? As far as studying the sea goes well, and providing a place for people for to get research oh, yes. from people in the area. No, I, I'm... You're right. We need we need more, more spaces. Uh, and as we make as we make more spaces, uh, they will be used. Uh, I, I don't think we can at this point, for instance, throw a throw hundred new marine stations around the coast and expect them all to be uh, used 
to the full immediately. But don't you think it's, it's good foresight now to oh to choose the spots to take definitely. advantage of it? Particularly when you have such a really an outstanding spot as this, and I feel that uh, the momentum's there now. We should take advantage of it. If we don't, uh, it may slide, and that would be a, that would be a tragedy. <laughs> facility. It's an extremely good site for a couple of reasons. It's extremely good biologically speaking with very good rocky intertidal collecting, fine sandy beaches, the estuarine situation with good mud. But perhaps even more important, it's a beautiful site and marine stations need fine surroundings to attract quality people. And if we are to have a quality marine station, we need these quality people. And I believe that with this site, we could compete with anyone in the world for personnel. 